In this video, we're going to look at the position function in two and three dimensions. If I want to know the location of something, I can describe that location with a vector. In component form, it might look something like this. r sub x and r sub y are the x and y components, and it's referenced to some coordinate system, which I define. Now the position function is a function of time. And so that might look like this, where here the x and y components are both functions of time. In three dimensions, of course, we would have a z component also a function of time. To see how this works, I want to define this function for an actual event. Let's see a video of that event. What's sometimes lost in physics problems is that they correspond to something in the real world. I threw that ball and we saw the trajectory. That was an actual thing that took place. Now to study it, the first thing I did was produce a graphical representation of that event. That was the video. My next step is I'm going to do a motion diagram. A motion diagram is where we take a series of photos separated by equal time. So I went to the video and I got a series of frames, each separated by about 1 15th of a second. Here's the first frame I had where the ball was no longer touching my hand. Now you can see it's blurred out a little bit because I, my camera's not very good, but I took a circle at the leading edge of the ball and found the center, and there I put my dot. I'm now going to do a schematic representation, a motion diagram, where my object is represented by a point. And I'm going to look at where that object is represented by a point in equal units of time, about 1 15th of a second. It was every other frame of my camera. There was the next frame, there's the next one, the next one, and you can see it actually went a little bit above the viewing area, but that's okay. In my method where I used a circle to put around where the ball was and then find the center of that in Illustrator, my program, I was able to find the center pretty well, even though only some of the ball was on the screen. Now it's coming back down. I'm using the same format where I find the circle at the leading edge of the ball, so it's all consistent. Should give me pretty good results, and there's the final one. To quantify this motion, I need a coordinate system. So I've established a coordinate system here with the origin at the first dot, horizontal, x-axis, vertical, y. And think that this is what you're doing when you're solving physics problems. There was a real event that you could visualize, and your coordinate system is a series of rulers that you place within your world from which you can quantify the motion of the objects that are part of your system. I can go ahead and remove the video frames now, and I have a series of dots with my coordinate system representing the motion. The first thing I want to do is identify the x position of the object at each point in time. Well, the first point of time, it's zero, and the second point of time, where is the x-coordinate? Well, I've drawn a yellow arrow from the origin to the x-coordinate of the second dot. That's the x-position of the second dot, and that arrow represents a vector pointing to that x position. If I look at the x position of the second dot, I might draw an arrow that looks like this. There's the third one, or the fourth one. There's the fifth one. I'm doing this separately to point out that each arrow starts from the origin along the x-axis and goes to that x-coordinate. If I add them all, it might look like this. So now I have vectors pointing to the x position of each object. Notice that each arrow is a little bit longer than the one preceding it by about the same amount. So the position along the x-axis is changing about the same amount for each time interval. What might be the mathematical representation of the x-coordinate of the object? Well, I found it to be two times time. And I got that by going back to my video and making measurements of those cabinets in the background that you see here and checking with the video to see how long it took. And I noticed that in about one second, it traveled a horizontal distance of about two meters. And since I noticed from my motion diagram that the change along the x-axis is the same for each unit in time, I've deduced that it's linear. And so I've defined a function as approximate to be two times time. A graphical representation of that x versus time would be a straight line. 
Now, if I want to describe that yellow vector as a function of time, it would look like this. The magnitude is 2t, and the direction is along the x-axis for every yellow arrow. Now let's do the same for the y-axis. The first dot, the magnitude is 0. For the second dot, a vector pointing to the y-coordinate would look like this. Since you can translate vectors, I've translated it along the x-axis so they don't stack on top of each other. Here's a vector that points to the y-coordinate of the third dot, the fourth one, and you can see their magnitude continues to increase, but only for a while. The maximum magnitudes are about here. Now the magnitudes start falling till it gets to nearly zero. And then, in fact, for the y-coordinate, the last one points in the negative y-direction. How might I describe how the magnitude of this vector is changing with a mathematical representation? Again, with a little bit of investigation and some measurements of the cabinets and the video, I came up with a function that looks like this. The magnitude of the y component, 9 halves times t minus 5t squared. How did I do that? Well, by looking at the shape, I can tell that the y component looks like an inverted parabola. The constant is 0 because at t is equal to 0, the position is 0. But at about half a second, it reached its maximum height of about one meter, and that's what this function gives you. And also, at one second, it has just crossed over to the negative, 4.5 minus 5, which is represented here. Again, that's not that important. This is just a simplification, but it's pretty close to being accurate. If I want a function that actually gives me those arrows as vectors, it's simply the magnitude, 9 halves t minus 5t squared times j hat, the unit basis vector that points in the positive y direction. The value of this gives me the magnitude of the yellow vector, and the direction tells me whether it's pointing in the positive or negative y-axis. Now, to find the position function arrows, I can just add the x and y component vectors together using our graphical representation of vector addition. Of course, the first one is just zero, but here for the second one, I have the x component vector plus the y component vector, and the resulting is the displacement vector for the object in that point in time. Here's the next one. The resulting vector is the vector sum of the x component vector plus the y component vector. One more, and you can see where this is going. I've put all the vectors on the screen, and now you can see how the position vector is changing as a function of time. And just to bring it back to the original video, there is a series of position vectors that is showing how the object is moving through space. I can come up with a mathematical representation for the position function in time is simply as a vector sum of the mathematical descriptions of how the x and y component vectors are changing. I just add them together. So my final position function is this, 2t times i hat plus the quantity 9 halves t minus 5t squared j hat. Now most often you are not going to be doing this process, going to some video, finding dots by looking at frames, going back to the original screen to come up with measurements. But I think it's really useful to see that because that's what it's representing when you see functions like this. If your textbook or a problem shows you this function with a bunch of parameters, it represents the motion of an actual object that you could measure it by taking films and looking at frames and bringing a coordinate system that is coordinated with actual rulers placed at the location where the event took place. Finally, we can calculate displacements. Remember, displacement is a final position vector minus an initial. So let's take that vector as our final vector, and I've translated it out away from the graph so we can see it. The initial vector is the one immediately before it. The displacement is our final minus our initial. So I've taken our initial and switched it 180 degrees, and now I'm adding it to our final using the tail to tip method. And the displacement vector then goes from the tail of the first vector, which is our final, to the head of our initial flipped 180 degrees. That vector calculated in that way simply gives you the vector pointing from the initial point to the final point. 
and I simply copied that green vector and moved it between those two points so you could see that that is true. And in that way, the position vector, which is a function of your coordinate system, can give you displacement vectors which are independent of the coordinate system itself. It tells you directly the vector between two points in time.